we're on Eastern time. Uh, I guess it's already Wednesday, April uh, 12th, 2023. I have been in this gas-sucking truck for 16 hours and 15 minutes. 16 hours and 15 minutes. Uh, good fucking God. Got about 45 more minutes, so we'll call it a 17 hour drive for this 63 year old man with the bad back. But the gas sucking truck with all of its warning lights. Let me see, there's a fine focus on here. I got that beautiful array of warning lights on my dash. This, uh, Performed admirably. Don't even know how many miles I've been. A thousand, maybe? I don't know. Uh, good God Almighty, but I am coming into the shithole town of my hometown. The shithole town of Hotlanta. Hotlanta, GA. Good fucking God, this town. I was born in bred here in Atlanta, Georgia. Good God. Going on 64 years I've been watching this town get overrun by clueless fucking morons and just turned into fuck, man. Uh, you know, I'm like 30 miles outside of uh, Atlanta. I, rem I, I mean, I remember when this was wilderness out here. And th this, this was the boonies. You know, coming out here to Noonan Palmetto and Noonan. Uh, you know, this is a serious trip out into the country when I was a kid. But, uh, there we go. Uh, they continue to pour in, so I am trying to stay awake for uh, 45 more minutes. Oh, Jesus. So, anyway, to keep myself awake, let's tell an Atlanta, Georgia story. All right, are we going to tell a Hambone childhood story, or let's tell a Jimmy Carter story. Uh, is Jimmy is he still alive? Is is that old man Jimmy Carter still alive? How old is he? Is he 98? I think I think he's been dying for like a couple of months. Uh, maybe he died today. I don't know. I haven't turned on my computer all day so I don't see the flags flying at half mast in the great state of Georgia so I guess that Jimmy's still with us and uh, so the story I'm getting ready to tell for all you whether you're a fan of Jimmy Carter you know as my mama would say history will vindicate Jimmy Carter and uh, I guess my mom is right, but this is one sore spot in the Jimmy Carter in saga that uh, even got my mama's panties in a little bit of a wad over this. Now the story I'm getting ready to relate, guys, remember this what was from my young childhood so I'm talking over 50 years ago that this shit was unfolding uh, you know pretty much just just the years I was growing up so I have not checked any of these historical facts uh, this is based on my memory of growing up in Atlanta. And so uh, if there's any, if any of you fact checkers want to go uh, check some of the details. But essentially the story went like this. So 
you got to understand that I was raised while my father, well, I mean, he died when I was nine months old, thank God, but uh, he was a successful physician in Atlanta. And so we had, I was raised in this nice home. I wasn't raised in, you know, the really upper crust parts of Atlanta, but in, a, in an upper middle class white suburban neighborhood called Druid Hills is where I was raised, which was about six miles outside of town. And he might have heard of Stone Mountain, Georgia, this big hunk of granite uh, with these uh, this carving of all of these, you know, Civil War heroes that's getting all the uh, limp dick lefties panties in a wad for the, the past 40 years wanting to erase that carving off the side of Stone Mountain. But anyway, so Druid Hills was about halfway between downtown Atlanta and Stone Mountain. So Stone Mountain you know, it's a state park and a very popular tourist area and whatnot. So somehow the powers that be uh, decided to build a freeway from downtown Atlanta out to Stone Mountain. Now, on the downtown Atlanta side were a bunch of poor black folks living in, uh, I don't, I, I mean, I honestly don't know if you would call it a slum. I'm thinking this area was, was roughly called Cabbage Town. It was somewhere where Cabbage Town meets Buttermilk Bottoms. And anyway, so what it was, was certainly, if, if not an outright slum, it was a lower class black neighborhood and then by the time you got to Stone Mountain 12 miles out at that point you were getting into you know trailer trash to the white redneck trailer trash on that end you know like 12 15 miles out from downtown Atlanta so you had the low class uh, well, by low class, you know, the low economic class black folks uh, in downtown Atlanta and the low class uh, white folks out in Stone Mountain. But in between who you had were, you, you know, the upper middle class, at least upper middle class uh, honkies. You know, the doctors, the lawyers, the university professors, you had uh, the net, you, you had Druid Hills where I grew up, you had uh, Virginia Highlands, you had Ponce de Leon, uh, these, the, you know, these honky neighborhoods, these with, with some politic, with some economic and political clout, was in the way between the rednecks on one side and the black folks uh, on the other side. So it was easy enough to uh, to do this eminent domain and shit on the two ends. So. As I recall, it was for some reason, I'm thinking, I'm throwing out the number uh, 400 homes uh, on the downtown Atlanta side, you know, you know where, the, where the Stone Mountain Freeway was going to begin at I-75 in downtown Atlanta, I think they uh, took, a, a, I don't know why I'm remembering 400 homes, 
I don't know how many acres we're talking about. I guess, I mean, but we're, we're talking some seriously prime real estate. I'm guessing 50 acres, maybe, uh, of prime, prime uh, real estate. Although, of course, you, you know, back in the back then in the 1960s it was still a slum but it was you know just ripe to be gentrified uh, but that hadn't happened yet uh, but you know we're talking essentially downtown Atlanta 50 or 60 acres pretty much in downtown Atlanta so they demolished all of these homes down there uh, so I'm thinking 400 poor black folks' homes. I have no idea how they were compensated, how uh, obviously if they were compensated, how fairly they were compensated. But there was a lot of, uh, you know, the, the little lefties, uh, and including my mother were uh, were not real impressed by it so I'm not sure what happened on the poor white side but I, I'm a, you know out in the country I'm assuming it was something similar so anyway they actually started building the freeway uh, on the outside, on the Stone Mountain side. So starting on the very eastern edge of uh, Druid Hills, I guess it was technically the Medlock neighborhood. And uh, so the Stone Mountain Freeway, they built the section, you know, from the edge of the Rich Honkies out to Stone Mountain uh, way back when. I, I, that, that piece of road, that kind of stranded piece of road was probably built in the 1960s and then they uh, destroyed all of these homes uh, down there in downtown Atlanta. And then what happened was the big fight to stop the Stone Mountain Freeway. This was a major part of my childhood was, you know, of course, our neighborhood uh, was adamantly opposed to, uh, adamantly opposed to the Stone Mountain Freeway. And there, you, you can believe there was some uh, political clout. There was some, basically, some rich lefties, uh, rich Democrats. Uh, I am sure that uh, were big supporters of Jimmy Carter, uh, wanting to stop this damn uh, freeway from coming through you know, Druid Hills and Ponce de Leon and all of this shit, I guarantee you that there was some serious political pressure on, uh, on Jimmy Carter. So when was, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't even remember when Carter uh, was uh, governor. Was he governor around late 60s or late, you know, if that was the end of the, after Lester Maddox, the, that's a whole nother story, Lester Maddox, but uh, anyway, so Carter had, you better believe that, that Jimmy Carter had pressure on him when he was running for governor, so he came out as opposed to the Stone Mountain Freeway, so I'm guessing and this is just an educated guess that while Jimmy Carter was governor that the project was officially killed, that they killed the Stone Mountain Freeway uh, bowing to the political pressure 
from all of these rich honkies, not one of whom lost a home in it. Well, the rednecks out in the far end, they were already screwed. And uh, so the, so all of these, you know, low-income black folks on the downtown leg of it uh, had been completely screwed. So they had already demolished their homes. They were so sure they were going to build this thing that they wasted no time in uh, bulldozing uh, at least dozens, and I think it was hundreds of homes. So anyway, so th so what happened to that land? I wish I knew how many acres. Uh, if, if someone wants to look it up, I'm I, I'm guess I'm just we'll call it 50 acres. So I am unclear, obviously, in my memory because I didn't know this level of detail. Who officially owned that piece of land? I, I guess it was officially owned by the state of Georgia, probably the Department of Transportation that uh, had, you know, gotten all of those homes through eminent domain and bulldozed all those homes. So it was just kind of a no man's land down there. And so it, I, I'm 99% sure it was not part of the City of Atlanta Parks and Recreation Department. I, I, I am virtually 100% sure it was never officially an Atlanta City Park. But this, so this was also, all this was happening right about when the hippies were uh, taking over Atlanta, you know, when the Allman Brothers used to play for free every Sunday afternoon in Piedmont Park, and uh, Atlanta is where any hippies in the South would congregate. So this area, this no man's land out there, where it used to be, you know, all of these homes <clears throat> became known as the Great Park is what it was called. The Great Park uh, is what it was always called when I was growing up. And you could just go out there. It, it, I mean, there was this like, it was just, it, just this beautiful uh, 50 acres of land right there on the, you know, the, the hippies were hanging out there. Uh, you could run your dog out there with, without having to worry about some cop uh, arresting you. You know, the road, there were no roads. All the roads had been, I mean, everything, the whole neighborhood was gone. It was just a basically wide open piece of open land that we just, my, my entire childhood, we just called it the Great Park. And that's what happened for uh, with with that land. So everything was hunky dory. Uh, it, it was the best of all worlds for people in 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 my position, being the child of a rich honky. We had no freeway going through our yard. We, we had no freeway going through our yard, but at the edge of our neighborhood, we could hop on the freeway and, and be out at Stone Mountain going that direction, and then uh, going the other direction, you know, we had this beautiful park that was just, just, just wide open uh, to go down there and hang out. So uh, that was the situation when uh, I was growing up, and uh, then, of course, so what happened is Jimmy Carter gets elected president in 1976. You know, the, uh, the man who essentially stopped the Stone Mountain Freeway thanks in part to all of the political donations coming from the neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, that is the man who became president of the United States, you know, with his big lefty, 
just his lefty platform. He was a, you know, back when uh, Southern Democrats were real Democrats, you know, not a limp dick lefty, when lefties were lefties and Democrats were Democrats. And uh, so anyway, we all know what happened to Jimmy Carter. So he was a one-term wonder. So he was president from 1976 to 1980. So he gets booted out in uh, he gets booted out in 1980 and uh, I need to make sure I, I don't lose the road here. So Jimmy Carter gets booted out in 1980 and then he goes looking for a place to build the Jimmy Carter library I think it's called the uh, what is it is it called something like the Jimmy Carter Peace Center I think it has the word peace so anyway so this lefty president you know the hero of uh, uh, of all of the usual lefty causes, he goes looking for a prime piece of real estate in Atlanta, Georgia to build his little lefty monument to himself. And take a wild fucking guess the piece of real estate that Jimmy Carter ended up with. It was the Great Park. So he goes in there, and, and uh, I, as I say, I'm 99% sure this place was owned by the state of Georgia. Uh, that, the, that the, quote, Great Park, the former uh, home of, uh, of, of hundreds of these low-income black people, uh, when the little lefty president goes looking for a place to build his goddamn presidential library, well, guess who gets hold of that piece of land? Uh, Jimmy Carter. Goodbye, the Great Park. That was the end of the Great Park. Uh, goodbye, hippies. Uh, the hippies got run out of there just like uh, the po folks did before them. And uh, so Jimmy Carter goes in there and uh, builds his presidential library, and I think it's called President's Parkway now. Uh, anyway, and uh, that caused quite a bit of gossip uh, <laughs> In the early 1980s, you can believe when uh, the man who stopped the uh, Stone Mountain Freeway and was the champion of the low-income blacks and the hippies and whatnot uh, ended up with, with that uh, with that choice piece of real estate. Uh, I, I I don't even want to think about the little backroom real estate deals that were cut with that bullshit. Uh, it's absolute bullshit. Anyway, I don't really want to besmirch the name of Jimmy Carter. I mean, compared to most of these fuckers, I guess he was as good as they get. But it just goes to show you, uh, uh, fucking politicians, they're politicians. Uh, and uh, when, when the rubber meets the road, uh, you know, their, their, their true colors come out. So uh, every time you, you hear about some, uh, you read about the Carter Library and whatever the fuck they call it, World Peace Center or what else, now you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. So that is my little uh, Jimmy Carter, Atlanta, Georgia history lesson. So uh, 
and do with that what you want and I have got to find my way to Sassy Dragon's house here at uh, it's 10 after 1 a.m. so Sassy Dragon I'm almost there darling bye guys